Hi, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to week four of After Effects and Untold Histories, which is NCAD's program exploring performance histories in partnership with IMA and also part of our contribution to the internationally group of, um, of researchers, museums and institutions. We're focusing today on um, archives and archiving, and in particular on innovative curatorial and artistic approaches to performance histories. And I, I guess over the last few sessions, we've been talking about activism, but I, I think our word here really today is about, uh, about how performance histories might be activated because our guests have not just turned their attention to past performances, but they've they found really stimulating ways of activating them. So that's a key word for us. And that's the title of today's session, Active Archives. Very lucky to have two contributors with us, Saskia Homkvisk and uh, Livia Paldi. You've made both a kind of distinct commitment to Ireland in some ways, but also to thinking about performance histories on the island itself. Um, and they're both in a moment going to make presentations after I make direct introductions to them. Um, and then there'll be opportunities for discussion, maybe in the last 20 minutes of this session. Um, we're going to go directly from one presentation to another. So please gather your questions and you're very welcome to use the Q&A function that you can see at the bottom of your screen to post questions which I will gather and ask when we're in that discussion phase in half an hour's time or so. So here's a little bit of short biographical detail, more information on the website. But first, Saskia Holmquist is an artist, a professor of contemporary art at the National Academy of Fine Art in Oslo. Um, she's an artist who's exhibited very widely. She has a background in a video and performance practice with a very strong interest in things like orality, what can be said, what can be contested, often using the interview format, conversational format, and often kind of challenging or thinking about what constitutes authentic expression. And forgotten artistic performance has been a theme of her practice and it's the theme of today's presentation as well. She's developed a concept, uh, an idea which I think we should come back to and discuss, which is that of back translation. And it has at its heart a, a really lovely phrase, beautiful phrase, I think, which is the idea of keeping history close, which is what we're trying to do today. And the work raises ethical and political questions again, which we might discuss later. And Livia Paldi is with us as well. Livia was based in Dublin until two months ago, until March, um, but was for four years curator of visual arts at Project Arts Centre in Dublin. Before that, she was in the Baltic Arts Centre in Visby in Sweden, and before that was the chief curator of the Machanuk in Budapest. Um, and Livia too has worked very Closely, we're thinking about performance histories and works closely with Irish artists such as Sandra Johnson at Project Art Centre. Um, and this continues, I think, in a new book, which is uh, called Weighted Out, which again also has a, a really powerful resonance for what we're thinking about today. And I remember the show, really vivid, memorable work, uh, the autopsy of uh, performative gestures was really a striking thing that's stuck in my mind for when Sandra worked with Livia. Um, so, we have um, a curator and an artist who both got very strong commitments to making archival works and performance histories public in some way. And Livia in particular in 2017 initiated the Active Archive, Slow Institution, which was a, a major research project, which was manifest in a series of exhibitions and events, which was to explore the, the history of the Project Art Center, a very vivid program, something we're going to hear about in a moment. But to end those brief introductions, I'd like to invite Saskia first to, to kick us off with your presentation. Thank you. So uh, thank you, David, for this presentation and thank you to the organizers for this conference. Um, I, as David mentioned, I, um, the kind of overall title of my work is Back Translation, which is a terminology coming from translation studies originally. And it is a kind of technical term uh, to look at structures to understand a translation process. And I'm kind of, I was interested in this um, wording, uh, thinking of structures and translating performance as in revisiting and looking back at um, plays and sites and um, a performance taking part in a certain history. 
So I have prepared a paper that I wanted to read to you. Um, and I'm going to turn off my camera and share my screen. Um, most of the, uh, or a lot of the time, uh, there's a black image. So don't worry if, the, if you don't see anything at moments, because that's how it should be, because uh, the text is really the, the image. Uh, so I will um, share my screen. I have been an artist for the past 20 years, as long as Northern Ireland has had peace, and I visited for the first time 20 years after the peace treaty. I came in search of an artwork from a near past, hoping to find an artist working with a performative practice who would perhaps be about my age as a start for building dialogues. I found a work from 2001 performed exactly 20 years ago. Northern Ireland was a place that I only had memories of from a distance, made by Swedish broadcasts during the 80s and 90s, reporting about the troubles. From what I recall, all they spoke of was religion, terrorism and borders. They didn't speak about colonial past, class differences or haunted history to my memory. Harun Faruqi and Andrei Uljic's film, Videograms of a Revolution from 92, is made from over 125 hours of amateur footage, news footage and excerpts from the Bucharest TV studio overtaken by demonstrators as part of the December 1989 Romanian Revolution. In the beginning of the film, there is a camera shot from a window that zooms in on the demonstrators below. The speaker says, the camera gets as close to the event as the camera lens allows. The image in the blue, wintry light is divided. The walls in the foreground and the action in the background pertain to different temporal frames. The image is unequally divided. The major portion is occupied by the foreground, which is not the focus of attention. The event has been shifted to the background. The camera gets as close to the event as the lens allows. The speaker is referring to a technical limitation, but earlier the speaker's voice describes the position of the camera with the words, the camera is in danger. The camera needed to stay at a safe distance and could only get closer by zooming in. But there is a technical limit to zooming in and how close one gets. I decided to zoom in on Northern Ireland. I was looking for a loophole to fit into, listening for allowance and permission. But as I did not know exactly which work I was looking for to start with, I was in a sort of darkness. Darkness as in not finding a way, as in not being invited and not expected. The work was being slowed down substantially by the difficulties of wrong projections, art which doesn't easily get made during turbulent times, especially not by women. New attempts were made, new starts and new visits. The work needed more time, much more time. Then a virus stopped travel, slowing the work down to a complete stop for a moment, preventing the artist, me, from going to a place she, I, was intending to go to. Only a handful of people knew about my intention, the intention to find an ephemeral work of art addressing futurity as a form of evidence of, a witness to, a sectarian problem and colonial past. In addressing an ephemeral work, working with the archives takes the form of sharing memories, care, fragments, stories entangled with history, connecting associations as a potential to unfix new narratives. The end to traveling forced the position of coming from elsewhere into a moment of truth. The standstill created a pause and then a hopeless waiting until a new temporality of slow time proved that a gesture had been initiated during those first visits, which had at the time seemed unfulfilled. A gesture consisting of a few meetings with wonderfully open artists had started a slow reverberation 
without the artist's eye knowing because of an early interest in a work and its refusal. The work resonated in its multi-layered setup, addressing an embodied experience of loss, but also offering a way out. But the artist wasn't there, nor the documentation, not wanting to be memorized. The only material witness was a text, a grainy black and white scan with a ghostly image. The work was almost forgotten and the subject had vanished. What was left was an imaginary. This refusal kept my interest high. The work remained irretrievable and fugitive. It created a learning from a lack. In not responding to a dialogue, access and continuity, the silence that, silence that frustrates, the boundary that makes you give in that the subject is not allowing a dialogue. Hungry listening by Dylan Thomas is echoing. The refusal described by Tina Kant as a rejection of the status quo as livable and the creation of a possibility in a negation, a refusal. Once I understood that the absent artist is the condition of producing this new work, the living artist who refuses to give information, denying contact, is a testimony and an evidence of a violent past and present, reincarnating through a temporality of absence. This work has become about listening, listening to darkness, absence, disconnection and dead time. Darkness as in first being blinded, to finding a path, new persons, an archive taking form in other dialogues, stories and new realities. The work started out with an intention to connect, an intention to work on dialogues through the act of listening. The gestures that were made two years ago or more had created reverberations and an impossible movement of relations, instigated through waiting, listening for answers, an enforced slowing down against the intention of what is usually thought as a dialogue. The slowing down was forced on the work in every possible way, by an artist with a curiosity in a work, but mostly by an artist disinterested in the intention behind a dialogue, forcing everyone with an interest to listen 
intensely elsewhere. This work is actually about love. The findings of a ver work that set its hope on love. I've seen your body dancing. I've heard your poetry about bruises and lost lives of Margaret. Your heart was confused between the poetical and political. The forgotten artist has said that no art is made during war. I'm here now. I'm in the interface in redress, decolonial redress, as in listening and facing difficult dialogue, impossible speech and change. Corona and the corona-induced digital interface helped filter and slow down. The full stop in traveling became a loophole to enter, to enter into a time of redress of artistic intent, motivation, interests, timescapes and processes. A bond, a bind, a telepathic way was created with Northern Ireland in not going, by not taking anything, by not wanting anything. I've shared some impulses and interests some time ago, now responding to minimal impulses coming back. Listening carefully to everything that comes by as precious. Signs are assigned the status of a document for the archive, a screen dump, a text, metadata, a couple of emails, a paper letter digitized footage, a chain of needs, all coming out from the ephemeral past of zooming in on a forgotten work that created limits to get closer. Okay, um, so this was the text and I um, should just mention that the work is, um, uh, the work uh, is called Club and made by Heather Allen and it took place in, at Waring Street in Belfast um, and it was a a kind of a very embodied um, work with a lot of uh, details and props and um, uh, props and music and different temporalities uh, taking place. Um, but uh, we might come into this later, but um, I also wanted to say that, I mean, this, uh, this paper was more kind of setting a, a mood and then uh, after that, I mean, I have kind of, I have started some other dialogues that are taking place now um, in the form of uh, a workshop that took place and that now I'm kind of in dialogue with some, uh, a person called Chloe Brown, uh, who is now working at Waring Street and we're kind of with the time gap and this space um, working towards producing work in another setting. But we can come back to this. Saskia, thank you very much. Um, that was beautifully written. I think we may have not seen the images that you present, I have to say. We weren't oh. quite sure because you mentioned the blackness, but unfortunately an image did not appear. I wonder, oh. wh I wonder whether we might try in a moment to, um, to would there be one or two key images? We heard the sound, yes. Okay, but then that's uh, at least something. <laughs> yeah, and it was more than something. It was lovely. So I'm sure that we can use it as the basis of the discussion, but thank you. Okay, yeah. Great. Livia, if it's okay, could we move to you now? I'll, I'll give you a shout if there are any problems with images. Um, okay, sure. Thanks. Okay, so hi, everybody. I, first of all, I'd like to thank for the invitation. 
uh, Kiara, Lisa, David, also David for the introduction and also Saskia for the presentation. Um, my, uh, I mean, I would say fragments of a former presentation would, would focus on the project that I started in 2017 and finished 2020 um, um, at Project Art Center called Active Archive Soul Institution. And I'd like to start with a, with a quote from Ines Schaber, an artist based in Berlin and Los Angeles, who came within this uh, framework um, to give a lecture and a workshop, and who, with whom I had a chance to work on several occasions, and who is super engaged with um, archival research, writing, and exhibition making. So the quote, I'm starting with the assumption that the archive is not only a place of storage, but also a place of production, that our relation to the past is materialized and that our present writes itself into the future. Thus, accordingly, I understand the archive as a place of negotiation and writing. Um, Active Archive Slow Institution began with a series of questions, those in relation to the status of visual arts programming a project, as well as those anchored to my own learning in relation to a wider cultural context into which I moved in spring 2017. Rereading chapters or fragments of chapters on institutional history, or I might say histories, support a nuanced understanding of professional trajectories, the emancipation of the arts in Ireland and the changing relationship of project to wider institutional, political, social, and urban contexts. I looked at these preceding artistic, structural, operative configurations in order to seek advice on sustainable future models in connection to the new development plan put forward in 2017 that saw Ireland's oldest multidisciplinary art center having survived a punishing recession and thus identifying with the changing cultural policy environment, the changing conditions of production, the changing needs among artists, audiences, and funders. Thus the archival inquiry process, the studying and interrogation of documents, and the archival environments and related artistic projects have supported a more complex and also nuanced understanding of the histories of the center from the perspective of timely and pressuring contemporary issues and urgencies. As in the case of most archives, the project archives also opened up to parallel archives and sub-histories, sub including the development of contemporary art and its institutions in Ireland and the changing political and social contexts the history of artist cooperatives, artist run spaces, studio facilities, the urban cultural development history, such as Temple Bar Culture Quarter, a government flagship project for Dublin's year as the European City of Culture in 1991, which has, and I think keeps being a much debated project with rising tensions between commercial and not profit enterprises, culture and tourism, and that face different structural and financial challenges. It also included the history of the Arts Council founding in Ireland, transforming conditions of artistic labor production, precarization within the neoliberal expectation economy, political agency, and also the history of feminism and LGBTQ rights in Ireland. Beside learning about the exhibition histories and strategies of working within a multi-genre organization, Project Archives also make one looking at what is the legacy of the Arts Center format how curatorial artistic leadership roles of a multi-genre cultural institution have changed or transformed due to structural, financial, administrative, personal pressures. And, and to reflect on how these have affected the ways the institution has advanced this cultural and social as well as political public discourse and advocated contemporary expressions pertaining to identity, equality, race, gender, class. I'm not going to, to go into project uh, history because Hannah Tiernan actually mentioned a few important dates yesterday uh, during a panel, but I, I would like to focus that my main areas of interest became the 1990s, the period of redevelopment of project, uh, when it was relocated uh, its performance space in January 97, project at the main to the Henry Street. Um, and this temporary working space, uh, beside this temporary working space, um, and during this period, the then visual arts director, Valerie Connor, who started working for project in 98 and worked until 2001, commissioned and organized a program of project described as offsite. These were produced at various other locations and in, in, in various media, 10, out, 10 in Dublin and around Dublin and one in Galway. The artists included was works at Talentire, Ronan McRae, Daniel Jewsbury, Patrick Parijoli, Sandra Johnston, Pete Smithson, Tina O'Connell, Tony Patrickson, Fergus Kelly and Dorothy Cross. 
the final event of the old building, which was another part of my focus was an artwork by late Morris O'Connell, who was artist in residence since July 97 and involved artists and performance and musicians who wanted to do something to mark the closure, ending a stage uh, of Project Art Center's history. The demolishing project 39 East Essex Street is closed to place between 2 and 14 February in 1998, marking and celebrating the redevelopment of Project at Temple Bar and accentuating its significant history. Unfortunately, I never met Morris, but in a very brief email uh, conversation, a few months preceding his death, he sent me a draft of his thought bubble and recalled that the demolishing project was a conversation. And I quote, I spent a vast time trying to see how the site might break its way into the future, given it was intertwined in so many significant practices. My role was really trying to crack it open once again, so even more could emerge and new directions could be explored, end of quote. The research also highlighted the inaugural exhibition, Somber Nirvada, featuring prominent Irish and international artists that launched the new Project Art Center on the 12th of June in 2000. The multidisciplinary show guest curated by artist Jackie Irvine was placed throughout the building prior to the final fit out and staff moving into the offices. Last summer, Irvine was commissioned an audio work revisiting the exhibition that you can all listen to on, on Project's website. The Project Art Center collection contained 160 boxes, including documents and print artifacts related to the activities of project between 1967 and 2003. It was donated to the National Library of Ireland in 2006 during the directorship of Willie White, uh, whose study on, on project theater history served as one of my first readings into the archives. The Project Art Center papers collection list number 152 was, led, the, was prepared. I mean, the preparation was led by Barry Hollihan and also the National Irish Visual Arts Library, NIWL, holds materials about project, as well as artist files. Documents are still kept at the center and in private ownership. I visited NIWL first in summer 2017 to view documents on Project Art Center, and I came across a condition report and feasibility study for a future archive of project that had been researched and written by artist Brian Hand, the former founding member of the artist collective Blue Funk. Um, commissioned in 1998 by the then director Fiat Moconel, the study aimed to present the board a report on condition of the existing building, as well as a plan for the establishment of an autonomous flood and fireproof archive space within the new building of project, which was due to open in two years time. The assignment was based on hands archive related practice, as well as his long history with the organization, a relationship that started when Blue Funk was invited to create work to close the old building of project in 1995. The other draft that I looked at was interdisciplinary collaboration proposal 9495, um, where Blue Funk proposed Porta Cabin, an insulated, wired, and heatable four person office space or site office to be brought and set up in front of the old project with a solid door and grill windows. This minimal space for shared activities and conversations aimed at becoming a discursive platform, a forum for debate that interrelate questions about art, the artist and contemporary society. The group's proposal positioned project as an exemplary case study, especially as it undergoes transformation. In his studies, Hand also speaks about the archival project as a valuable resource and should be made accessible and something that should be made accessible to a wider readership. He writes, quote, there is at present a debilitating scenario within certain cultural practices, perhaps due to the fact that each new initiative, which seems to spring from somber and leap to over, imagines itself as reinventing the wheel all over. Project's archive is a repository of history as occasions and lessons of success and failure which if made more widely available, would definitely benefit the culture sphere. Obviously, um, this 400 square foot archive room and some other functional spaces proposed uh, in previous constructions plans were largely abandoned in the very final stages of the building. Each day on my way to the office while I was living in Dublin, I looked up and think about the airspace above the disused second floor terrace at the front of the building of project 
which could possibly have housed the archive, among other utility spaces missing. The Active Archive Slow Institution Project has made an attempt to temporarily rehabilitate this absence, this absent archive in the gallery and transform it into a place for questioning, hesitation, suspension, and refueling. From September until late December in 2018, Project Gallery was transformed into a work and meeting space where various documents relating to the center's archive were studied and shared, digitization of different video documentation and conversations took place, as well as was a place for initial mapping of the available and accessible public records and privately collected materials. At the launch of the project in 2018 August, we presented Brian Hand's edited single channel video under the one roof with a new video in conversation with the original slide and back, black and white 16 millimeter film from the same period. The footage is also contained glimpses of the preparation of the final fire performance of Morris O'Connell's demolishing project 39 East Essex Street is closed. And I just realized that in the meantime, I, I would share um, yes. Um, so the public presentation of the research um, mapping process was initially planned as three chapters. The first opened in January 2019 and was titled The Long Goodbye. Um, I'm sorry, I think this is... The Long Goodbye and it featured new commission by artists they revisit documentation from their own archives and present possible research trajectories within the project archives. It focuses on the late 1990s, as I mentioned, that marked the turning point for project's operational model and the finalization of a decade-long negotiations to provide project with its current building. The long goodbye, a changing installation of timeline documents, moving image, sound, and photographic works, uh, framed and continued um, continuing inquiry with specific focus on the demolishing project um, and the off-site series curated by Valerie Connor, the exhibition brought together various perspectives on the conditionalities and competences of inquiry, as well as the possible role of the subjective and the fictitious in reflecting on historic images and documentation. The exhibition zoomed in on overlook details, revisited materials, memory of the sites project once occupied, and sketched its various trajectories. It explored the fragmentary way, the journey from the 1966 inception as a migrating artist run initiative to the coming home moment in June 2000. The participating artists included Brian Hand, Fergus Kelly, Miriam O'Connor, Tanet Williams, Dorothy Hunter, and Hannah Tiernan. Um, within this Active Archive Slow Institution, I also initiated. Um, public viewing series, a series of discussions and viewing of documents that accompanied the project. Its first session including the display of the video self-documentation of artist Sandra Johnston's two performances within the off-site programming. Reserved in 98 that with the help of Susan McWilliam, these materials have been digitalized and the first time made available for a smaller public. Sandra Johnston had two performances preceded by a 24 hour sourcing private performative action in one of the hotel rooms in the former Ormond Hotel. This was titled Room 112, while Reserve was played in two subsequent e evenings on the rooftop of the, of the former hotel. In parallel of the active archive and in connection to the 90s research, I also invited Sandra Johnston to work on a solo exhibition that opened in August, 2019. The publication waited out after quite a long delay was soon go to print and make available a long conversation and materials related to the show and the research leading up to it. On 5th March, Project Arts Center hosted, um, hosted the second chapter of the Active Archives Law Institution. The Queer in Progress timeline was to map LGBTQ histories and even more specifically would look into lesbian, female identified, transgender and feminist activism and practices. With special focus on the 80s and the 90s, the HIV campaigns, Queer in Progress timeline began with an exploration onto projects LGBTQ theater history. The ongoing body of research has been collated by artist Hannah Tiernan, who's also presented alongside her current investigation into GCN, 
the Irish Queer Archive, and the Out Magazine archives. The timeline was identified as a tool for pooling, revisiting, and bringing into conversation various points of views, individuals, groups, and communities to unpack less visible and often suppressed, overlooked, and neglected aspects of complex historical events, challenging simplified media representation. The display was to change and expand through collaborative editing during the two weeks and beyond. The wider public was invited, was to be invited to contribute to the evolving timeline and its periodical updates to challenge the power structures of canonized perception and readings and to present concerns about visibility, measurement, normalization, temporality, presence and absence, representation of otherness, desire and difference. Due to the pandemic restrictions and the closing down of the building, we could only host one public viewing event. All other workshops, gatherings, walks needed to be canceled. These were meant as close readings of a selection of materials and documents relating to LGBTQ history, especially from private sources. Being developed in collaboration with GCN and several communities, activists and cultural practitioners, a display including documentary films and videos by Sonia Mulligan, German, Cara Holmes, Caroline Campbell, Linda Cullen, and one panel of the Irish Names Guild with special thanks to late Mary Shannon, founder of the Irish Names Project and custodian of the Irish Names Guild for kindly providing us with a panel. The Irish, uh, the Queer in Progress timeline currently takes the form as an online archive platform led since March this year by artist researcher Hannah Tiernan and puts forward the importance of temporal open and inclusive archives that accommodate changing needs and foster a dialogue about queer archiving as well as the point as well as archiving queer lives within institutional practices it highlights events that point at the social political economic and medical complexities but also the absences and silences resulting from censorship limitations to document and preserve as well as lack of space for sexual and gender difference Exploring narratives of emerging and changing experience that might manifest through personalized collections of records, community-based archives. The project looks into questions of historicizing and memorializing and how queer archival practices can help us transform conventional approaches to archiving with a strong critical engagement with many of the issues present, including misogyny, homo and transphobia, HIV racism, and various forms of discrimination and marginalization. So Hannah, ha Hannah Han has become the custodian of the project that continued as the online archive. You can find the entries that are, that are growing until probably this summer. And she took over it as also as a platform that also means a certain kind of collaborative way of working with several other platforms, organization and colleagues. And I think I'll stop here. Um, and probably we can we can discuss certain aspects during the conversation. Thanks a lot. Great, thanks, Livia, and thanks, Saskia, as well. Really, um, really vivid material. Um, maybe I could start with a few questions, but um, I'd like to open it out to the audience as well. So please do use the Q&A function if you'd like me to, um, to share a question on your behalf. So my first question really is to do with, um, I suppose, a paradox for me in a way. Livia, one could imagine that when you were appointed, you could imagine that the program that you were going to deliver would have a much broader European focus, given your, um, you know, your strong CV in that regard. And yet you really invested in um, thinking about how to uh, really do a deep archaeology and an excavation of, of this material. So I, my question, and I'll, I have one that's quite related for you as well, Saskia, is really about, um, about what it means to come from the outside of a culture and to do this kind of work. So could I start with you, Libya, and then Saskia, I'll ask something similar of you. Yeah, it might. Uh, thanks for the question, David. Uh, it might sound as a kind of a contradiction, but I, um, for me, like curatory work has always been very strongly related to think about the institutions mm -hmm. that I work for, and also tease out questions about you know contemporary conditions of production. Um, the artists that I actually invited in parallel or after before the active archive events uh, happened to be 
artists who also work in different parts of Europe, also in some point work yeah. with archives and archives that has a very strong relation to political history or mm. the politics of history as well. Mm. And somehow bring together questions around personal and collective memorialization processes as well, investigations. So, and it wasn't like kind of meant to be like a very rigid way of just inviting artists, mm -hmm. but for some reason, um, I think the, the processes that I'm interested in and the artist practices I'm interested in somehow always correlate with, with, with some aspects of, of, of working with archives and mm -hmm. historical records. So, um, and one of the things that I, I realized is it's, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it was a process for me to, to get to know the place. Hmm. And, and also in between figuring out what that gallery space can be used for. I'm not saying it was 100% uh, success in that sense that project doesn't have the space for, for necessarily visualized public events. Mm. So that also kind of started questioning about different possibilities for transformation and how for a shorter time, maybe this sequences of like exhibition making practices can be suspended. Mm. And the last thing what I wanted to mention, it was also a very, very important way to, to, to kind of, the project parallels certain artistic researches as well. That's why Sandra Johnston, the project with Sandra was, was so much kind of a back and forth between talking about archives, talking about the 1990s and then working on, on, on the exhibition. And the book as well is sort of containing archival records and, and references that didn't find their way to the exhibition. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it, it was kind of a long process for me as well to, to how to how to manage these different types of working with artists and also kind of tease out also questions about institutional responsibilities mm. for historical um, aspects as well, which you know it's has never been in a book about projects, so which is one of the oldest uh, art centers. So in that sense, I think it also correlated with a lot of international um, international questionings. Yeah, thank you, and Saskia, I mean. As you were talking, and I'm picking up almost a kind of tone of words, you, you talked about allowance and permission. So again, I wonder if you might reflect on what it means to be somebody from without who comes to work on what's a highly contested history. Yeah, well, um, I think uh, it's, uh, I can relate to what Livia was saying now, um, that you need to kind of find some way in and and find those dialogues and start those discussions from some kind of common interests mm. and listen to um, whether you're giving the permission or not and uh, and those permissions are opened up with time and 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 uh, insisting on on certain things um, yeah so that's I guess a way that I've, I've been trying to work, but I didn't come, you know, normally um, one comes with a, a kind of commission or an invitation through an yeah. institution. So I didn't have that kind of entrance point this mm. time. And it was uh, more in relation to this particular history and maybe also, you know, my own lived history uh, becoming of age mm. that certain suddenly there is this, um, time when I can, uh, you know, think of, of histories that I have not maybe been part of, but I, that I have kind of been part of on parallel, sort of. So that is a kind of new in my practice that I can kind of relate to these kind of histories now, um, almost becoming 50, <laughs> that there is this other way of, of and also then, um, finding artists in a similar age, maybe to kind of connect to, to entangle these kind of, uh, also between artists and, and different ways of relating to place and history and stories. And it's not about reenacting work, it's about really making new work together. Mm. Um, and the position of coming out, 
from the outside is also uh, one of a curiosity in, in, a, in a place and finding those kind of dialogues that can take form. And what you presented had a lovely lyrical quality, but I wonder if I could tempt you into a slightly more concrete space of, you, you mentioned Hella, Heather Allen at the end. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about your way of working with Heather Allen. Oh, well, yes, uh, that's a tricky question mm. uh, because um, I, I kind of uh, uh, found this art or got this article where there were three works presented and I quite fast became interested in this work and, mm. uh, and thought that I would, it would take time maybe to, to find the artist, but um, yeah, so, so I, I invested a lot of time into just finding other people who knew her or had mm. been to the performance. And um, uh, yeah, so I got a, information from, from elsewhere and I thought that um, I would find the artist mm. because the artist li is alive. Um, but uh, so in this case, I didn't get a no uh, and I didn't get a yes. So there was a sort of silence, and um, which was which took a lot of time to process what that is mm. and what kind of circumstance in this particular sense also uh, in related to the kind of work that she did and um, in in relation to this history. So I think that's what I've been kind of thinking a lot about in relation to ethics around. How to use this work, mm. and um, yeah. And in the in the presentation you gave us, you made reference to Dylan Thomas and this possibility of a refusal, as a negation, as being a kind of meaningful act that it might have meaning in its own right. Could you say a little more? Yeah, I think in the beginning I was uh, I was kind of thinking around the dropout artist as this mm. kind of statement of of. Uh, from being from an inside going to an outside, but I think with time um, and in you know thinking of a post-colonial and decolonial kind of viewpoint as as stepping out of a position as an artist, I think it me it's it's a political act, and I cannot just step in and take mm. over that work. Mm. So I'm kind of moving out, but still giving reference to it as a as a way of including it as a as an important kind of starting point for the process. We have a comment actually here from Alan Phelan. Heather gave up on art a while back, I believe. Was that why she perhaps never got back to you? She was a real force in Northern Irish art and a great loss, but like many, she was ahead of her audiences and so very much underappreciated. Yeah, this is the kind of thing I don't know, and I can't answer to. Mm. It's uh, it's um, it, it's kind of evident from the work that it was a very strong practice, and that she was very invested, and it's kind of very layered and has a lot of um, yeah potential. But yeah, for some reason, she has decided to step out of the art world, and she doesn't want to be in dialogue. Mm. <laughs> That's clear. Livia, could I ask you at all about sort of response of artists? I mean, in a broad sense, to be told your work joins an archive could be seen as, I suppose, putting a spotlight on it, giving it attention, that word that has so much currency presently. But it might also look like a kind of ossification, you know, a sort of fixing. Did you experience any caution or reluctance on the part of the artists that you worked with? No, like, uh, not really. I think, I think, uh, how is it? The questioning started more with using the space mm. of the gallery, which was, uh, which, which most of the audiences probably uh, see that it's assigned to, to a series of exhibitions. Mm. So it's also just the questioning of like how the operation of the gallery was kind of suspended for a while. And it's, it's, you know, I just, I just kind of followed upon projects like uh, trajectory as an experimental institution as well. And, mm. uh, and on the other hand, I think that was also a questioning of like whether more people can be involved, not necessarily via exhibitions, but also via dialogues and yourself is also 
part of the workshop with Sebastian Chihotsky, um, the chief curator of the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw organized. So I, I also felt it was a moment where we could bring in a lot of different materials and a different, um, different kind of references. Mm. And I have to say, um, setting up the online archive as well and and now having Han as a Hanna Tiernan as a as a custodian and also kind of um, refuses this project to be kind of ossified and and also like it's not about who has the project or who curates the project but it's it's also like a platform a more inclusive platform for for disseminating or sharing information it's not going to be complete it's just it's just a way to 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 work towards a kind of a more, more, uh, what would say, democratic history as well. Mm -hmm. When we talk about LGBTQI plus history as an island, so I think what I saw myself uh, a little bit, maybe sometimes too ambitiously, um, is also someone who facilitates yeah. via the archives, via this kind of opening up research, is opening up questions as a foreigner, as an outsider. I think I, and I, I still feel that it was just basically scratching the surface. There are so many different ways to, to look into this history. And funnily enough, or not surprisingly, everything is written, all the future is written on those documents. So it's not, it's absolutely not an ossified one, but it's, it's also very difficult when an institution doesn't have the records in the house, but you actually have to ask permission to... Mm -hmm. To present your own history and you're not allowed to read some of the documents for the next i don't know 20 30 years so it's it's and you mentioned that you know like exhibition making as well the pandemic took a lot of things and the possibilities of, of working together and creating this kind of shared events this public viewing series mm -hmm. further but it also took took my plan to to actually make an international exhibition that looked into various archival strategies especially in, in, in places, countries, um, and contexts where specifically, let's say, LGBTQI plus histories are, 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 are strictly kind of hidden. Mm. So it's, it's, I really wanted to, to, to look into, and it's not necessarily just artistic practices, but also documentary and other practices, mm. film. Um, but unfortunately, that has to happen somewhere else. Mm. And somewhere else. I'm very struck that you're very attentive to giving credit to others. I think that's a really virtuous thing that all the way through your talk, you clearly identify collaborators, partners, authors. Um, so there's a kind of sense in which the ownership of this object is not singular. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. And, and, and to be honest, it's like, like, I think when we talk about ethics as well, like I'm, I'm, I'm aware of like, it's a, especially with the LGBTQI plus archives and personal commitments and, and conversations. Mm. The first public viewing that we were able to do on the 6th of March um, was really like a very shared intimate space where we viewed and shared documents that are not for public uh, record. So it's it also kind of created uh, such amazing conversations of methodologies and strategies, but that was also like a very great sense of like support and and how would they say um, and concern mm. for protection as well, you know. So that's 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 also like and for me to be honest, it's it's yeah I initiated this project and I I let's put it that way curated the long goodbye and mm. and initiated the display but I'm it's not my project in a sense uh, for the future if somebody wants to use this type of framework or that's why the online archive is super important and that's why there are many colleagues that I can I can mention who who probably will feed in and that's why it's important that Hannah was Hannah Tiernan was kind of following since let's say 2019 mm. 2018 when we were preparing for the long goodbye and so were the conversations with Valerie Connor and, and lots of different artists. Also, I have to mention Sarah Pierce, to whom I'm super thankful because um, she also had a series of amazing archive projects, also connected to project and also as former head of board, um, was super supportive mm. to this. So I, I think you need to have this environment and I, I don't think things happen uh, just because you do them. So for me, this collaborative environment and, and the acknowledging of that it's, it's actually a collective making is, has always been important. Mm. 
Saskia, do you have thoughts about collaboration? We've talked about permission a bit, but I'm thinking more directly around co-creation. Yeah, I mean, I I sometimes have, um, I mean, all, all my works are in collaboration, mm. um, or most of them, um, but they, differently. So sometimes it, it kind of authorship of work like films um, are sometimes still kind of in my name. Uh, but um, yeah, there's so many people involved always and um, they are credited. And in this case, I mean, more than in, in some other works, um, it's kind of looking to, I mean, I am also a facilitator in that sense. Mm. And I, I kind of see, um, yeah, I feel very much like Lydia and kind of coming from the outside, you can kind of facilitate some discussions. And um, I think this was the case with the workshop that I did at Ulster University, where we looked at Heather's work. Mm. And I mean, it was basically this text and had a kind of two day seminar where we were, um, and the students there were around 20. So it's kind of looking at the time they were born is when the performance took place. So mm. it was this also kind of um, circular process of looking at history, but from another generation's perspective. Mm. And it was, uh, yeah, incredibly interesting discussions we had that then became a score that they wrote and uh, all their names were kind of mentioned and we took part in the BIFA um, festival, performance festival. Mm. Um, yeah, so this is um, just, just to not let this slip, you mentioned back translation. Could you say a little bit more about this as a method for you as an artist? Um, yeah, so I think I mentioned in the beginning that back translation is a terminology from translation studies that deals with um, it's a it's a structure. Uh, where you kind of look at, uh, let's say, the, the structure of a language that you mm. don't understand to kind of make sense of how the translation is made. So as a way of going back to understanding. And I thought that was an interesting way of looking at history and performance, especially that doesn't have um, that doesn't have, I mean, maybe there's some documentation, but it's kind of evaporated mm. and uh, and the the only way of recuperating it is by being in dialogue looking at documents rethinking um, yeah looking at where it took place and sites and so on so that the, kind of going back to the structure and revisiting as a way of rethinking or mm. rediscussing things so that's how I kind of use but this is not the work of a historian, right? This isn't simply to somehow accurately document. Translation has some active sense of uh, creation of the new about it as well. Yeah, it's a living document. Mm. So um, yeah, so it's it's producing new work, um, not and not reenacting mm. the original work. And Livia, with the um, could you say a little bit about the future? of the material that you have gathered. So it has an online life, but what is its life, its future in a material sense? Where will it be? How might people access it? I mean, it's a difficult uh, situation because obviously the material, the career in progress timeline uh, will be accessible as Hannah is working on it until the summer. So that's going to be more or less a finished thing. The rest of the documents are on my hard drives. And that kind of waits for, I mean, the long goodbye was one, one way of make it accessible. And I suppose it should be like a series of texts and, and also reflections mm. and looking at some situations where these documents can be, can be kind of unfolded or, or, or made accessible. But it's, mm. it's actually, it's a little bit too much for an institution that is not a museum that doesn't have the infrastructure and yeah. personal to, so we are back to Brian Hand's kind of uh, feasibility study. And it would be unfair to, to push it as a, as, a, as a certain kind of uh, task. So I yeah. think that that's also something to think about how to, 
how to make those. And it's very complicated as you also reflected on, on, on copyrights. Mm. That's an entanglement of different kind of negotiations as well. Mm. But I, I, I'm still kind of thinking about how this can be contextualized in a, in a, in a kind of a wider uh, way. So it's, it can be brought in um, through the back door and through the hard drives and, and, and kind of give it a life on a different on a different level so i have a few things in mind but i yeah i'll i'll see how how all the conversations that i i had recorded and also conversations that i still would love to have and and to look into the wider political social um histories so it's it's a kind of a i don't know it's kind of it needs to be it needs to be figured out mm. yeah um Sandra has a point here, Sandra Johnson. It is interesting how both Morris and Heather were engaged artistically with a deep understanding of temporality. They made their gestures very precisely in time. It's beautiful that they are being remembered here for how those actions continue to resonate. But I'm also reflecting that they would be bemused by the process of holding on. Their personality is always pushing for the space of interpretation to remain wide and challenging. So that's from Sandra Johnson. Thank you, Sandra, that's really vivid. Saskia, do you have thoughts about that? Well, um, yeah, I'm not sure if they, if, I mean, in Heather's case, I'm not sure what she's um, uh, thinking. I'm, I, I think a way, uh, it, it is, of course, it is a kind of tribute to be remembered and, and brought back into, into a history again. But I think there is a, a strong resistance as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I'm unsure to which extent the work can be drawn in um, again, at least for me. Um, but it's, yeah. Thank you. And Livia, do you have a thought? Oh, I, I, I would leave this to, to when we finally can present the book because it's fantastic to, to work with Sandra and Morris uh, has been mentioned a couple of times also because of their, their, their project together, uh, this environmental theater back in the nineties, the, the Dialogues Lab. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, really, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm very sad that I was not able to meet him. Mm. Um, but I guess this, uh, there are some small fragments that, that he sent me and I, I was, I tried to present through the PowerPoint, this, this amazing kind of document that, that he wrote in the hospital that, that sort of like uh, gave us a certain kind of mental mapping. Mm. of the demolishing project as well so i mean he was involved in with also brian Connolly, and there are lots of people that i you know i, I mentioned that we were not able to to expand the project mm. into that direction but obviously uh morris o'connell's work and practice would be one of the mm. one of the one of the major focus um yeah and the, the great thing about an open approach an archival approach is it doesn't necessarily fix meaning it creates material which might be shared, reinterpreted, it might be precisely as we've been discussing an active yeah. archive. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, like for me, um, the public viewing series and sessions were, were particularly important. Mm. Um, it's just the question about how this conversation, how this, you know, the documentation of the conversation or the conversation as a document it can be made accessible. And I'm, I'm not so sure that all in each and every minute of this process, which could be very valuable to those participating in it, mm. it can be made accessible. So that's also something that happens in the archive that you have this kind of moments where you realize that there are certain limits mm. to what can be shared. So certain things and certain temporalities just keep to the participants as well. Mm. So it's, it's a very interesting thing to negotiate. Mm. And the other one is writing captions. That's another thing that is an ongoing negotiation of how you describe things, how, how sure. would you bring them together. So mm -hmm. I think the display for the queer in progress as well, the idea was a public editing process mm -hmm. to actually really invite people to, 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 to contribute. But I'm pretty hopeful that this will happen at some other point and in some other ways, but mm -hmm. um, obviously not in the project gallery at this point. 
Yes, it may be wrong to predetermine as well, right? That openness is important. Yeah. Hannah Tiernan, who's been mentioned a few times, um, Hannah says, I'd like to thank Livia for her generosity in her acknowledgement of myself and all the other artists and for her fantastic presentation. I'd be interested to hear more about her curation of the two active archive gallery displays, in particular, the long goodbye. How did she come to select? Oh, here we go, select artists and works and what informed other curatorial decisions? I think they were like largely because I'm, I'm also aware of like we're kind of running out of time, but um, I just tried to be uh, quick. Like, as I mentioned, Brian Hand, one of the things beside a feasibility study was Brian's videos and film, uh, 60 millifilm. So this was a kind of an initial uh, initial stage to, to look at those documents. I also have to um, acknowledge again, Susan McVellian who helped us um, digitizing things as well. And not just Sandra's uh, performative performances, but also other, other materials that might come up at some point later on. Um, Fergus Kelly was also part of the offsite project. And I knew that I visited Fergus as a huge archive that also kind of helped me to, to, to display what kind of a vast material you can work with. Um, uh, Hannah and, and um, Hannah was like part of the research process as well. I wanted to give space to, actually the timeline was me meant to be changing as well, which didn't really happen because of, you know, this, this, this time that it takes to negotiate, to, 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 to place the document. Dorothy as well as, 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 as the as artist also in the Dutch uh, Art Institute, she also kind of put forward a, a notebook and a, and a certain way of instigating research into fires, for example, and eventualization. So I also saw this show as a kind of a framework to also let people experiment. Uh, Miriam O'Connor's uh, work actually, Isla Blue, is online a PDF format that we prepared like last year mm -hmm. to, to actually present her research work as well. But that was, that was, that was actually uh, Valerie Connor with whom I shared, I wouldn't say curatorship, but we kind of did that in, in collaboration. And so I would say like rather curating, it's, it's a little bit more like maybe facilitating also space to, to other projects and other points of views to happen. Like the long goodbye wouldn't have been made without Valerie because because her pre her presence and work um, was so important in the in the in the late nineties, especially through the offsite, which was a brilliant series of programs. So I think, but I also like there are certain limits. And Tonnet Williams um, was also a choice, also because of conversations of his researches around around specific uh, like the desk of Walter Gropius but also his kind of in-betweenness between functional objects, props, uh, you know, certain kind of structures, build structures, but also strong references to the archive. So the table that was, that was a kind of an out, like overgrowing slide viewing table that it sort of always was, was as, a, as a certain kind of piece to, to disrupt this, this, this archival um, structures. So I think that was a certain kind of conversation between the works as well that was, that was important. Mm -hmm. That was a fairly big presence at tables, but it seems that you know, when it comes to archives, it's, tables are important. <laughs> but sure. Fergus's like, sound piece was also fantastic because it was yeah. filled, filled recordings and people entered and they could, depending on the generation, they actually could, could recognize TV news or, or radio or, so, you know, I was also kind of created a very different type of timelining through this, this massive audio, audio recordings, yeah. And I recommend that you can listen to it. There's a link through the project website, isn't there? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Just as we come to the end, Saskia, could I ask you just to reflect on looking forward a little bit, this body of work you've been doing, do you have future plans? Will you be back in Ireland when circumstances allow? Yes, definitely. I've been waiting for a long time. Um, and yeah, much body of the work hasn't been made, but time has certainly changed mm. the, the way of negotiating a place. And um, so that's been interesting with this period of time with how 
strange it has been mm. but time has done something to those processes mm. and um yeah but hopefully now uh, within yeah the autumn some maybe some presents can actually just got some i mean th uh, a film will be made but but also this kind of more physical um presence in belfast great well, we look forward to that very much. And Livia, we look forward to your next return to Dublin as well. Can I thank our speakers? Really fascinating. Very kind of you to share your work with us and to share your insights as well. It's really been a very enjoyable last hour or so. Um, perhaps I could just say that um, there's a session this afternoon as part of the um, After Effects series. So at four o'clock, there's what we're calling a sidebar conversation with Leah Hilliard, Sarah Pierce and Niall Sweeney, which is to think about um, alternative spaces and club cultures. And uh, if people want to sign up for that, there may be still spaces. It's a limited conversation. If you look at the website, you'd be able to check. But in the meantime, Saskia, Olivia, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks for us all listening and watching us. <laughs>